Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. Really excited to still be at American Anthropological Association's annual meeting. We are now sitting down with Dr. Alex Barker. Thank you for coming on to the show. My pleasure. Really appreciate it. And I'm very happy because we have a lot to talk about. This is the first time we're sitting down with someone that is actually curating um, archaeology and anthropology at museums uh, and art. So this is going to be, I'm really excited. So your, your background's awesome. I want to teach everyone about your background. You're the, currently the president of the executive board at AAA. Also uh, got the PhD in anthropological archaeology at University of Michigan. And he was former curator of archaeology and anthropology at the Milwaukee Public Museum for about six years. Or so and then now is the director of the Museum of Art and Archaeology and also the director of the Museum of Anthropology at the University of Missouri Columbia and that's been for the last 12 years and three years respectively so wow okay cool how did um, before we get into you know what it's like to even curate um, archaeology artifacts as well as um, our uh, anthropological art and whatnot um, how did you? How did? How did you, as a kid, get involved in <laughs> anthropology? When I was about fourteen, I started volunteering at the Milwaukee Public Museum, and I volunteered in the anthropology section with a woman named Nancy Lurie, who went on to become the president of the American Anthropological Association. Whoa! And shortly after I started volunteering, some folks came in and did a program about archaeology in Southern Illinois, and they were with the old Northwestern program and they allowed high school students to come in and do field projects. And I snuck in before I was actually in high school and did my first series of excavations in the middle 1970s, but while I was still a, an, before I even got to undergraduate, and I'd done three years of excavations before I started college. Three years of excavations pre-college? Yep. Whoa. So by the time I got to college, I pretty much knew what I wanted to do. Yeah. Okay, whoa, okay, so in this is this is crucial because this is starting to really uh, continue this this <clears throat> this really dire need that we have for 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 youth for children for kids to have some sort of mentorship within their op the equality of opportunity for them to find mm -hmm. what they love and then to have that mentorship. You you were fourteen when you started um, being able to have this access to archaeology as something that you cared about. Now, where did you go for three years to? To, to dig? <laughs> well, the first two years was in a little town called Campsville, Illinois, which is a tiny little river town. There's not much there besides a ferry, but the old Northwestern program under Stuart Strever had developed a whole series of excavations at, at major sites ranging from archaic sites through Late Woodland into Mississippian sites in the Illinois River Valley and mainly in Macoupin, Calhoun counties. And so there were different projects going on with different crews. But there was this odd period there in the late 1970s in particular when it seemed like everybody who was doing American archaeology was working at, at Coster or at McCoupin or at Worthy Merrigan or one of the other sites based out of Campsville at one time or another. So it was a very magical time Why? where I can go back and look at, at colleagues years afterwards and we compare when we cross paths. And why in the late 1970s was there a lot of archaeologists in that area. But it is a heyday of what's been called the new archaeology. Uh -huh. So it is a, a period when people were moving from more normative approaches to culture history to looking at more scientific issues of process. And we've moved a little bit beyond that since then, but at the time they were really heady days where there was a sense that we were transforming the discipline and the way we were approaching ancient cultures was fundamentally different than the way we'd done things before. There were some problems with that approach, and, and mm -hmm. it's been revisited since. But at the time, it, it seemed like a revolution. And revolutionaries have a lot of zeal and energy. And Stu Strieber was one of the leaders of that movement. And what was Stu's kind of big th thesis around the movement? Well, there were a whole series of folks who founded the new archaeology. And I'm not going to get into all their names, but their approach was really that if you looked at questions of culture process and culture history, you could treat it as any other science and ask broader, more nomothetic questions about why something happens. You might be able to develop predictive models that say that under these conditions, this mm. is a way a culture as a series of processes would respond. Mm. Looking at systems theory and feedback loops, 
mainly in terms of environmental issues because they're easier for us to capture with archaeology. It's harder to capture ideology. We can mm -hmm. talk about it, mm -hmm. but it's mm -hmm. tougher to measure and tougher to assess. Mm -hmm. But responses to environmental changes, that's something we can get to pretty easily. And this is especially through um, assessing artifacts for like carbon dating, things like that, or is that that's way better, or is that like, that's, yeah, that's... <laughs> well, partly cool. for dating, but the other, some of the techniques that were really important during that period, it's the period when we first started doing something called flotation on a large scale, flotation. which is when you take samples of soil from an archaeological site, you float them using either water or, or different chemicals, and it allows you to capture the light fraction of material, huh. charcoal, plant residues, huh. things like that, uh -huh. and oh. analyze them separately. And you capture not just what you were able to see and collect by hand, but everything that was there in that sample of soil, and a heavy fraction that includes zooarchaeological material, bones from animals, microflakes, things like that. It was always there, but in, in periods before that, it was more common that you just collect the things you could easily see. And this was really looking right. at a much finer yeah. scale yeah, of information. Like and soil compositions. Right, and the, the, the tiny things that are left behind. So instead of just thinking in terms of larger artifacts or objects like a deer scapula, yeah. you look at all the fish scales. Oh and you yeah. get a much finer grained idea of how people were actually living. And fine scale changes as you move up and down the stratigraphic column. Interesting. Over time. Whoa. And what were you know even before we keep going i'm just so interesting now because you're the first person now that's that's taught me about how you can analyze you know things like soil composition or, or some of the things that are not larger artifacts so what were some of the profound realizations from from doing so oh just a, a complete change in our understanding of the economics of some of those prehistoric societies We'd focused on them in terms of gross indicators that were easy to observe. Mm -hmm. And when you actually looked at things in detail, it was very clear that a lot of smaller kinds of, of organisms were being used. It wasn't all deer, it was small animals and fish, things that are harder to see. Mm -hmm. It was also going from imagining that a lot of prehistoric societies were using a single crop like maize to understanding how complex their diet really was and moving from wild resources were being collected to domesticated crops and back and forth over time. That was a much more complex mosaic of how people were living than we'd imagined originally. Cool. That was in the 70s. And yeah. since then, instead of just looking at fine things, we're also looking at the chemical composition. Mm -hmm. So you're able to say, all right, people are changing their diet. We're not just finding artifacts or ecofacts. We're looking at the actual bones of people. Mm -hmm. and or, or Sometimes it's not even the bones of people, but maybe the bones of the animals they ate, yes. and getting a better sense for the environment from that. By looking at levels of strontium or carbon isotope levels, we get a much clearer idea of what the environment looked like. Yeah, yeah. And all of that's just in terms of the environment. You can still look at all sorts of other questions archaeologically, but our ability to trace some of those patterns over time has gotten steadily better with time. I've really enjoyed the way that you uh, illustrated it as a mosaic, a complicated mosaic of, of, of anthropology and archaeology, of how they lived. Um, <clears throat> that's a great way to put it. And I think we're too often thinking in large artifacts and too infrequently looking at those other complicated nuances that are sometimes so small as, like, you do flotation in order to figure, figure the composition out. Whoa. Another area that, that really took off during that period was archaeometry. So you might have a piece of stone. You can do the chemical composition of that piece of stone or a piece of pottery and get an idea for exactly where it might have come from. Then you can start tracing trade patterns over time. That's still within archaeology. Within the broader field of anthropology, the other thing that's really changed is 25, 30 years ago, we would have thought in terms of, well, we can analyze human bones and learn these things. Now there's much greater sensitivity than there was a quarter of a century ago to the idea that before we do that, we really have to talk to descendant communities and find out if these are questions they're comfortable with us asking, and whether these remains are appropriate for that kind of testing. Oh yeah, oh interesting. So you need to get permission to test remains. F In most for cases, science. yes. Yeah, yeah, interesting. And it's not simply a matter of getting permission, it's recognizing that there are multiple constituencies and multiple stakeholders involved in the things we study. Yeah, and yeah. we have to work with those stakeholders and be yeah. sensitive to their concerns. Yes, yes. Whoa.
Okay, that's a great way to, to kick us off. Now, wh now, what is it like to to go through a? Okay, you're now so now you you end up you figure it out. You're like, okay, I'm ex I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna enter into school with a passion for archaeology and anthropology, and then. Um, and then how did it look like to your, you know, to figure out what you wanted to do for your thesis along that journey? <laughs> <laughs> There's so much to, to learn. And right. To figure, yeah, so how do you pick? Well, that was a problem. I think, like most people, I went through a series of different ideas. And in some ways what ended up happening was I had an idea, I started pursuing it, and then I discovered there were certain things I couldn't do, and so I had to adapt what I was studying to the material I was collecting. My original idea was that Sometime around, oh, 700, 800 A.D. in the lower Mississippi Valley, you get the emergence of societies that look more complex. They're building large mound sites. They've got much larger settlements scattered across the river valleys, but they're taking off before we get the advent of maize. So corn agriculture doesn't seem to have come in yet. We're not seeing the full development of what later becomes known as Mississippian society, but there are very large settlements, large mound building communities, and it wasn't altogether clear what they were, how they developed, and why they don't develop into something even larger and more complex over time. Mm. So it looked like they were developing and then collapsing and developing and collapsing. Mm -hmm. And I was interested in trying to understand that cycle of development and collapse. Mm -hmm. And then the there's, would, what were some of the findings? Is it a, was it a, about some of the power dynamics that caused them to rise and collapse? Well, in, at least in my analysis, and there's a very gross analysis compared to what we do today. That was 20-some years ago. But at the time, it was looking at factors of the scale of settlement and trying to measure by modeling how much wealth was flowing back and forth between communities. Mm. So if you imagine that these are hierarchical societies, there are some communities that are producing more wealth and it's flowing up the hierarchy. And there are ways to mathematically model how much wealth is flowing from one community to another, at least theoretically, yeah. based on, on how rich the environmental zone a given site is in and how big it is. Yeah. So if you imagine that everybody's just eating what they consume, over time the size of a settlement will grow and not exceed the size of the catchment area, the mm -hmm. amount of food it can mm -hmm. produce. And yet, we see again and again what appear to be communities that are larger than they should be given that measure. Mm. And the suggestion was made many years ago that this is because they're gaining food from other communities. Yeah, yeah. They're gaining resources from other communities. And so I, I simply modeled that yeah. for this period. And what you see is a series of, of growth and collapse curves in what's called the Coles Creek period. And in trying to understand that, I also measured what would happen if you assume that the reason that's happening is that these early leaders who are forming multi-community polities, if you assume that one of the things they're doing is that in bad times, they provide relief, they move food back and mm -hmm. forth. And if that's happening, what's the effect? At the same time, there are models that have been in existence since the 1930s for how a given household decides how much food they should grow. And when you put those two models together, you get a weird effect, which is that everybody's better off if you move food around and help people in hard times. But the more you do that, the margins of surplus that are being produced by each household go down. Mm -hmm. And so over time, the system, which is a very good system, collapses. It just can't sustain that because you're depending on producing a surplus and that surplus is actually being reduced over time. Mm -hmm. Okay, whoa. So, okay, so and let's see. And it's even more boring in the original than it is when I try to describe it. <laughs> so let's see if, let's see if I can, uh, let's see if I'm, if I can, I guess, uh, syn synthesize or further unpack this in a way that you say is, 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 is right. Now, a s society can be positioned in a resource-rich area or they may not be positioned in a resource-rich resource area. And that is a, that's a, one of the variables to calculate of how wealthy they may end up being, is how much abundance they may have, how much surplus they may get. <clears throat> they may be positioned near a water, like a river, 
and that gives them f easier access to travel, to transit to the other areas um, for trade. And so, so then the way that that, that group evolves or that, that society evolves is different than one that was in a resource, not as resource rich of an area. And then you were also mentioning the, uh, the dynamic of, of certain um, people producing some surplus and then other and then that surplus decreasing so that they can help people in need mm -hmm. in that in their society we well, can imagine that visually if you imagine a graph that has one axis that's how productive that the area of a site is uh -huh. and the other is how big the site is okay you would expect to see a more or less linear relationship okay so yeah yeah you have smaller sites and areas that aren't very productive and larger sites and areas that are more productive uh -huh. When you actually graph that out for these societies, you get a series of lines, oh, one above yeah. the other. Yeah. And the explanation that we believed at the time, at least, was that it's because you have some villages that are producing food, some villages have people who are being supported by everyone else, Yes. and they're larger than you'd expect those villages to be based on how productive they are. Oh, okay. And you're able to model how much wealth of whatever kind is flowing from one set of communities to another set of communities. And in these cases, you'd have two Whoa. or even three tiers in that line. Okay, so so um, so then a, a a society that has more people that are needing assistance of those that are making the surplus, their productivity line is a little bit lower. Um, it doesn't rocket up as as much. They're they're less. They're, they take up more floor space or floor, more societal space. They're a larger society, but they're not as productive because there's more people relying on the surplus. I wouldn't put it that way. I'd say instead that you've got some some communities, some individual settlements have people who aren't producing their own food. It's being contributed by other folks. So the settlement gets bigger than you'd expect based on how oh, productive, productive it, is. it is. Okay, so then they they're so consuming that, more. They're considered their settlement that is receiving trade from another location and they're not yeah they're not producing themselves they're consuming <laughs> from they're relying so they're in a non-resource or less resource rich area um which is maybe one of the reasons you're able why. to model why there are more people that's so this so so is so complicated a, one of my colleagues <laughs> a guy named vin stepanitis had observed that he'd observed these patterns from earlier research and he was able to come up with mathematical models that let you calculate how much wealth was flowing between the different levels that you were able to see those different lines. Oh, and okay. so that's what I used. Yeah. On the flip side, since the 1930s, there was a theory advanced by a guy named A.V. Chinov that said that if you're, in a if you're a household in a non-cash economy, you can't always convert the surplus you produce into more wealth. There's a limit to what you can do if you can't convert it to cash. If you ca yeah, because you could just sit on that resource without being able to distribute it to anybody. Right. Yeah, yeah. And so there's a the utility of the amount you're producing at some point intersects with the drudgery of producing it. That's right. And if like even here, there's like extra food from some of the engagements and, and the extra food is not being brought to those in need and it can go, it's, it's an extra, it's, it's a big issue with, with extra food production and homelessness what we see in San mm -hmm. Francisco and all these other places um, because it becomes more of a drudgery to go and move the extra food to the location where the homeless are, um, th then, so then you just toss it. It becomes, it, the utility is, isn't, is gone, it's diminished. Well, if you can't convert it into something else, you may not, just may not produce it. Yeah. But those two systems are in conflict because a system that, where you're extracting food from one level of society to support another level of society, and that's justified in part by the fact that by producing that extra food, you can move it around in time of need so people don't starve. But if you're not gonna produce it in the first place because it's not worth it and you can get the food from other sources, then over time that surplus decreases. So you become more and more dependent on a resource that's becoming scarcer and scarcer. Then the system collapses and then reforms and does it all over again. Now, since then I would say there are some problems with that model, but that's what I came up with at the time. Whoa. Okay, that's so. In, that, this is this is really cool, Alex. Um, probably um, understanding how civilizations uh, flourish and how they uh, fall is probably one of the coolest 
things about anthropology. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let's um, let's move into how. So, was it the Milwaukee Public Museum that you first were injured when you were fourteen as well? It was, yes, it was that. Okay, so then you ended back. up going back to to do the curation of the mm -hmm. archaeology. Okay, cool. So, yeah, how did uh, how did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, before I finished my dissertation, I was hired by the Dallas Museum of Natural History, and I spent about seven years in Dallas. Toward the end of that period, I started out as a curator, then I became the chief curator, and then I served as interim director for a while. And at the end of that period, the museum was going through a transition. And they were really wanted to focus more on dinosaurs. Anthropologists don't do dinosaurs. That's so paleo, paleontologists. Yeah, that's paleontology. And yeah. we do early humans. They, they may be fossil, but yeah. if it, dinosaurs aren't what anthropologists do. So I was looking for other opportunities. And at the same time, my predecessor at Milwaukee, a woman named Ann McMullen, had moved on to the National Museum of the American Indian. And Anne was a fantastic curator, but she contacted me and said the position at Milwaukee was coming open. Mm. And for me, mm -hmm. it was coming home. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I was very excited about it, and I was lucky enough to be able to go to Milwaukee, and I was very happy there. And so what was it like, because you gained seven years of experience in Dallas, and then mm -hmm. you brought that to Milwaukee, which was great. So like, what were these first sort of um, experiences as a director uh, and understanding like which artifacts do I bring into which exhibits and what does like, how does that work? <laughs> <laughs> well it's complicated in part because the director really doesn't decide those things. Mm. It's always a group that decides it. Okay. And ideally it's a group that reflects not only the professional staff of the museum but the larger community. Okay. And so it's a negotiation that goes on. It's always trying to balance the interests of the community, what you've done recently so you're not just repeating yourself. If there are, are hot topics and issues you'd like to address you want to bring in exhibitions that can do that. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you've got this background going on of processing objects that are coming in from the field or that are being brought in through donations, and they may not match up with the exhibitions you're trying to do. So you've got to do all of those things. Plus, there are always opportunities that come up. We have a, a project going on right now at the Museum of Art and Archaeology that has to do with the trafficking of culture, especially antiquities, that oftentimes enter the illegal market. Mm. So source countries like Italy, Egypt, Greece are always facing a problem with looting and objects being transferred out of the country illegally. Whoa. At the same time, they've got this huge backlog of antiquities that have never been studied. So yeah. over time, we were able to develop a relationship with the Capitoline Museum in Rome. When Rome became the federal capital of Italy in 1871, they cleared lar large parts of the city to build new buildings for the national capital and they encountered all these antiquities from ancient Rome that have never been studied. They've been in a warehouse called the Antiquarium in downtown Rome ever since, and they've never been analyzed. So we're now in a series of loans where they'll send us antiquities that haven't previously been studied. We analyze them, we do archaeometric research to figure out where they came from. Cool. We do high resolution scanning of them and three-dimensional imaging. We Whoa. study them formally to figure out based on art historical information, when they were produced, where they were produced, compare that with the analytical results, and then we send them back to Rome, and they send us another group of objects, and we do the same thing over again. Oh, and over so time, cool. the idea is to remove that backlog of unstudied yeah. antiquities. Yeah. Wow, okay, so there's a couple things there. The, f um, the first thing you said that was cool was that, that it's not it's not even just a group of curators at the museum, but you have to, you deal with the community's interests as well. Right. So then you guys have a kind of like a back and forth about what you want to feature in mm -hmm. um, as exhibits, and then that was really interesting that you bring up this this a uh, backlog of artifacts that need to be uh, that need archaeometrically analyzed. They need or just just to be documented. They need so to be documented. that we know it's there. Yeah. Antiquities trafficking is a huge problem. Yes, yes. There are, at different times, and, and this is a controversial statement because it's hard to really get a firm figure on it, but at one point Interpol said that antiquities trafficking is the third or fourth mo most lucrative form of crime worldwide, that it, it lags behind drug trafficking and arms trafficking and God knows what to do with human trafficking. Yeah. But beyond that, antiquities trafficking and art theft is a huge business. Yeah. In some cases, the markup between the amount that's paid for an object that's looted 
what, what the looter himself would get or herself would get and the amount that it sells for on the market can be in the millions of percent. Yeah. And it's exploitative, it destroys the culture history of an area, it robs people of their heritage and yeah. by doing that part of their identity. But at the same time, it's hard to combat when there's that much money involved. So there are a series of different initiatives all around the globe trying to stem the trafficking of antiquities. Part of it involves enforcement of regulations and laws prohibiting that kind of looting and the movement of those objects. Part of it is increasing the flow of antiquities in the licit market, not necessarily for sale, yeah. but at the Capitol Line, for example, all of those objects we're documenting can now be used and loaned to museums around the world. They can be used in programs they become available for broader use now that they've been documented. Yeah. Until then, nobody knows what they are, and so they can't be used. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for bringing antiquities trafficking to our, our, our spotlight here, because that's huge, and I don't think we talk, I don't think we, we, have, we haven't talked about that on the show yet. That's a, that's a huge one. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, but it's, it's also become huge in, the, in recent years. Up until maybe a decade ago, there were very few prosecutions for antiquities trafficking because it was felt to be white-collar crime or there were very few real victims. In the past few years, it, there's been an understanding that looting and the destruction of heritage is also involved with trying to control people's identity. Oh, yeah. And so it's become much more of a big deal, even for the U.S. government. Yeah. Be the, the destruction of antiquities by ISIS or ISIL or Daesh, yeah. whatever you want to call it, brought to the fore the fact that you can manipulate people's understanding of who they are yeah. by changing their heritage or taking their heritage away. Mm -hmm. So it's become a, a broad and very complex issue. Because on the one hand, the US government now views this as geopolitical and a security concern. Yeah. That's not our concern as anthropologists. Our concern is much more immediate that the heritage itself should be preserved. Preserved, yeah. But there's an overlap. There is, yes. If you, wipe, if you successfully wipe out artifacts of a population, you can make it look like that population didn't exist. And then that, that, that can alter the way we perceive history. And then that, yeah, that it's really important to document. Now, can you tell us, teach us about these processes that you were talking about? So you. You, when you receive one of the backlogged artifacts from around the world, which is, it's, it's so interesting that there is a backlog that needs to be documented, like you were saying. That's so cool, and we need more archaeologists then to process this and document this, um, this backlog. So you'll get, you'll get like a shipment in of, of artifacts, and then now you were saying like 3D scanning and um, um, ar 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 archaeometrics. Um, mm -hmm. This is very interesting. So like what, yeah, what does that process look like? Well, the objects come in. Uh, we may get a couple hundred objects at a time. We document them using art historical techniques. There are styles and, and maker's marks and other things that have been documented through several centuries of research now. And we're able to get an idea of what the material is and when it dates to based on that art historical analysis. So that's the first step. The next step is we're able to take chemical samples from those objects and then analyze them, mainly using mm -hmm. neutron activation analysis. And neutron activation analysis? Yeah, we use a reactor. A and reactor. It, by, you're measuring the backscatter uh, of elements and you're able to tell what the chemicals are that are actually present Present. in that material. Okay. And okay. by doing that, you can get the recipe for the clay. Oh, well, you're, you're trying to find the neutron as in in the atom, in the... Well, that's what we're using, yes. Yeah. And but then what we're really measuring are the elements element that are present in, in, yeah. the, in okay. the ceramics. Interesting. And then you're able to compare that recipe to the recipe of ceramics made from other places. Okay. Oh, and oh, by doing oh, that, cool. we can trace where the ceramics were made. Yeah. So, for example, in the most recent batch of artifacts we've been working with, there are three distinct areas where Roman black gloss ceramics were being made, or, or at least three different recipes for the clay. And we're able to trace those. In the next group, we'll be looking to see if those same recipes are being used, if they change over time or in different locations, or if there are different ad additional sources that are being used. But at this point, we don't know. So that's the next step. After that, we start doing three-dimensional scanning, both very high resolution, blue light, fringe, well, a very high resolution scanning that's at a good enough scale that we can do things like look at the scratches on the bottom of a pot 
to figure out how it was being used. Mm. So one of my colleagues, Marcello Mogetta from the University of Missouri, is leading a project yeah. looking at the use wear at the bottom of the pots mm. to figure out how mm -hmm. they're being used. Mm. And what are the different ways that they can be used? Well, some of them are simply in included in burials, so they may not be used very much at all. Mm -hmm. Others have been used on a daily basis, and they've mm -hmm. got heavy evidence of wear both on the outside of the vessel and on the inside from stirring or from cleaning or from all sorts of other things. But from he's able to actually document yeah. those, yeah. Yeah. which requires a fairly high-resolution kind of scan. We're also using something called reflectance transformation imaging, which is a, a marvelous technique. It's one of those innovative techniques that you really wish you'd thought of because it's so simple. You take an object, you put it in a hemispherical dome that has light scattered all around it, mm -hmm. then you take a series of digital photographs, mm -hmm. and each photograph has light from a different source. Yes, yes. Then all you do is interpolate that using software, and you're able to create using exactly the same technique you use in a movie like Shrek, mm -hmm. whereas Shrek moves through through the, the film landscape, uh -huh. the shadows change, yeah. and it looks very realistic. Yeah. This does the reverse. It says that if I'm seeing these shadows, what's the surface look like? And you're able to mathematically calculate what the surface looks like of the object from the shadows cast from all of those different sources of light. Huh. Not only does that give you what the surface looks like, but it also means afterwards, after it's gone back to Italy and it's back in a storehouse in Rome, you can look on your computer and move that light source around and get raking light across oh, that object from all different dimensions. Yeah. And what's wonderful about that is many of these objects have maker's marks on them. <coughs> Excuse me. And A maker's mark is the maker has a signature, a trade. A stamp. Stamp, right. yeah. And over time, if you look very carefully, we're able to not only see what the maker's mark is, but we can see it wear over time. So as an early yeah. use of the stamp, we're late to use. Whoa. There's, see, yeah, just, I was just imagining you receiving a batch of artifacts and, ha and going through all of this process. And then the nice thing, like you said, is when it, not only is it the nice thing that when it goes back, you, it's all documented. Is that a decentralized documentation? Can anyone from around the world come and get that, um, that light scan the sure. shadows? Yeah. Sure, and in fact, the project that Marcello is leading, it involves folks from four different countries already, and the material is broadly available, and the metadata for it is actually being stored not only by the Italians, using their own system for storing metadata, but it's also being served up from the University of South Florida through a colleague, Rachel Opitz. Dang. On this like long-term uh, civilizational evolution, there's like a point of 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 humanity realizing that oh crap, like we should document what has <laughs> happened. <laughs> oh, that's good. I'm not sure we're there yet. <laughs> we're <trying. laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. We're I'm not sure we're there yet either, but it seems to be coming pressing. Even though there's so much of the digital age is distracting us towards what this, this, the cycle of information is so, it just, it's gravitating us towards what's happening every single day, even though what has happened in the past has yet to be so thoroughly documented and understood. We just keep living in the next <laughs> day on this, on this news feeds mm -hmm. and dang. Oh, it's a, a huge problem for anthropology in general, because if you think of archeology, span it's nothing but the anthropology of the past. So all the questions we ask as anthropologists, archaeologists just translate those into a thousand or two thousand years ago and ask the same things. And it is incredibly complex to try to understand human behavior in the present when you add the fact that we're not able to observe it directly. We have to infer it from other things. When you get to archaeology, it just adds another layer of complexity. Yeah. How many artifacts, before, before we get to the University of Missouri-Columbia, what um, give us an idea of how many artifacts approximately across the world you think are still undocumented and which cultures oh, have the Lord. most. I, I, I couldn't even guess. Yeah, yeah. The number is, is staggering. It's like trillions? Something I'm like sure that. it is, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, every, every culture that ever existed on Earth produced objects. Yeah, yeah. Not all of them survive. 
to the presence, but a lot of them do. In some cases, we don't even recognize them yet because we don't have the right tools. But the number of sites that are unknown is unknown. We know the rate of destruction to some degree, mm. and the rates of destruction have been skyrocketing. So we have this resource of unknown scale, and all we know is that it's being destroyed at an accelerating rate. But how much is left, we have no way to tell. Mm -hmm. And which cultures would you say have the most undocumented artifacts? I don't know. We don't know. You were saying that like there's a big backlog in Greece and Italy mm -hmm. and whatnot. So, so there is a big backlog in certain uh, cultures and then, yeah, okay. Yeah, areas where there's been a lot of archeological work done, there may, has, may, there may often have been more archeological excavation than there has been analysis. And by the way, that's true of the US as well. We have a big curation crisis where there are huge collections that may be documented in the sense we know they exist, but they've never been adequately studied. The problem in the other source countries isn't that they've got a problem that's fundamentally different than ours. It's that there's not as much looting for international trade going on in those other countries. There's a lot of it in some of those source countries. And it's not just Greece, Italy, Egypt. It's also places like Cambodia. It's the Niger Delta. There are a lot of places around the world where the, the scale of looting is incredible. Estimates say that, wow. that probably 90% of the sites in the Niger Delta have already been looted. Oh my God. And it's a guesstimate because we have no way to estimate yeah, sites yeah, that yeah. we haven't seen before. But if there's a site and we know it exists, it's almost certainly looted. There may be sites we haven't found yet, but for the sites that are known, almost all of them have been looted. Now, before I forget this question, because I want to hear your opinion on it, what are your... Do, do most of the antiquity thefts go to private collections? And what do you think about private collections versus public collections? It's a very difficult thing to answer. A lot of them where it's obviously been looted are going to private collections or to unscrupulous museums. There are still museums that acquired antiquities that have been looted. The current guidelines and standards prohibit that and they usually require that museums be able to find the provenance of an object back to at least 1970, which is the date that UNESCO passed a convention on the trade of, of antiquities. And so the current guidelines say that it needs to have left its country of origin by 1970. And if it didn't leave before then, the likelihood that it's generating more looting because it's coming from sites that are still being looted or the circulation of that object, buying and selling that object, is likely to contribute to ongoing looting is much higher. If so something came out of the ground in 1800, it may be moving around, it, it may be problematic and not clearly documented, but if it came out of the ground in 1800, its acquisition isn't necessarily driving further looting. It's a very complex and controversial topic, but if it's after 1970, it's supposed to be prohibited. But some museums still acquire, or they bend the rules, or they accept flimsy evidence for, for provenance. But most, mostly I'd say it's probably in private hands or moving to countries where they have different guidelines. There's no international standard that everybody has to follow. UNESCO is as close as we've gotten, but all countries haven't ratified that treaty, and they enforce it in unequal ways. Mm -hmm. Whoa, okay. So, by the way, I should add, we're pretty bad about it too. It's not a condemnation really? of other countries. Yeah, U.S. accepts um, uh, looted artifacts sometimes. Well, it can happen, but the other, there are two parts to it. First, the UNESCO Convention really only applies to museums. It doesn't apply to individuals within the oh, U.S. They can do all sorts of things. Private collectors can do what they want with looted. Right. And don't we have global law though to for for like taking a private uh, for taking a looted artifacts for a private collection? Like, doesn't that? Well, it's getting into a very complex area. Yeah. Very briefly, up until the 1970s, 1980s, looted objects basically couldn't be prosecuted criminally in U.S. courts because there was no one who had legal standing to bring a case. Mm -hmm. There was a, a doctrine called the McLean Doctrine that developed after that, that provided some standing for countries that have nationalized their antiquities. So if there's a patrimonial law that says all antiquities are owned by the government and we know it came from a given country, then using, a, using the National Stolen Property Act of 1934 as amended, it was possible for those countries to bring a case in U.S. court. 
because we know who it belonged to. It belonged to the government of that, that country. Mm -hmm. But they have to have a very clear patrimonial law. It has to be evenly enforced, and it has to be well publicized. So it only works for some countries. In the same way, the U.S. never fully ratified the UNESCO Convention. It only ratified two parts of it. So the only countries that have protection in the U.S. under UNESCO, that this is legal protection, are the 18 countries that have signed a bilateral agreement with the U.S. Mm -hmm. There's not a memorandum of understanding in place. They're not protected. The ethical guidelines for museums protect antiquities from everywhere based on the UNESCO Convention. But legally, it's a much narrower standard. Wow. Okay, now if now as we as we move into the current um, director of Museum of Art and Archaeology and director of the Museum of Anthropology at the University of Missouri, Columbia. Now, I, I love that campus. I've been there before. I really like your campus a lot. It's super nice. I, and I haven't been to the museums yet, so I should I should go check it out. Now, question maybe one of the first questions then is um, how many of the artifacts are a permanent artifact versus like what percentage would be just transitory they come in they stay in the exhibit and then they go to the next museum that kind of a thing well we do a certain number of temporary exhibitions generally we we consume fewer temporary exhibitions than we generate so right now we have two temporary exhibitions on the road mm -hmm. one is an exhibition of work by the New York artist Simon Dennerstein and the other is an exhibition of baskets from around the country. It's the first big summary show of American basketry from Native America all the way up to contemporary fiber artists. Yeah. And both of those are traveling at the moment. In the past two years, the only temporary exhibition we've brought in is a show called Electrify, which is an exhibition, it's a juried exhibition of art by emerging young artists with disabilities, and that's traveling nationally. Cool. Okay, so, so do most um, museums have out, out, outbound um, traveling exhibitions more than inbound? No, most museums actually consume more consume than they produce. They produce. Okay. We do it because we're poor. We don't have the budget to, to consume a lot of traveling exhibitions. Yeah, yeah. So okay. we try to put our stuff on the road and we bring in traveling exhibitions gotcha, when we can. Gotcha. But most of our temporary exhibitions are in-house using our own objects. We have in the Museum of Art and Archaeology about 16,000 objects in our permanent collection, and maybe 3% are on display at any one time. 16,000 permanent objects right. in, but, art, in art and archaeology. Yeah, okay. but only a small fraction are on display, so the ability to bring out objects okay. for a temporary oh, exhibition is always there. Now, how do you pick what, with, with the curators and the community, how do you all pick, oh, well, we want objects from 10,000 years ago or 1,000 years ago, how, how does that happen? You mean for acquisition or for an exhibition? Uh, Let's do for you. You 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 tell you teach us. Yeah. Well, for an exhibition, you work with with different constituencies and figure out what the overall theme of the exhibition is going to be. And once you've done that, then the individual curator would give shape to the show. Like anything else, when you do something by committee, you get an awful lot of good ideas. But ultimately, you have to choose a single set of ideas. If you write a paper by committee, it's never quite as good as if the committee provides input and then one voice puts it together. Uh, the obvious example is the Declaration of Independence. Everybody talks about what should be in it, and then Thomas Jefferson writes it out, so it's in one voice. Mm -hmm. Exhibitions are the same way, and the voice of the exhibition is usually the voice of the curator, but the topics and the themes have been developed in consultation with other folks. Okay, okay. And then, um, in and then, so then the, the, the consultation, is, there, is, is it like a, what, what kind of a process, I guess, is it to, 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 to consult with everyone to figure out what uh, artifacts are going to be in, involved in? It, it varies completely by the exhibition. Sometimes you're dealing with multiple faculty members. There may be different communities or, or groups within the community who have specific concerns or interests. Sometimes it's temporal. So right now we're in the middle of the centennial of the end of the First World War. November 11th, mm -hmm. 1918, the guns mm -hmm. fall silent, more or less. Well, that's a topical thing. And so we reach out to different parts of the community and different institutions, the State Historical Society, the libraries, um, veterans groups, all sorts of different groups. What should we do? What should we talk about? Sometimes we have those conversations and it turns out we're not the right venue. And so the exhibition goes somewhere else and we help mm 
another venue exhibit, exhibit it or develop it. Sometimes we're the right place and we'll work with those other partners to develop an exhibition that involves their resources as well as our own. And sometimes we just have the consultation and then we mount entirely with our own resources. And so what, what now, t teach, teach us about what is some of these sort of realizations that you've had over the last, you know, more than a decade now with um, the University of Missouri at Columbia. What has, what have been some of the, um, the sort of like aha moments in terms of museums and curation? <laughs> Probably the biggest one is that everything about culture, everything about exhibiting culture is a moving target. So what made sense a decade ago might not today. And we can keep going back and talking about many of the same problems and projects time after time. And they're always fresh because people are looking at them in new ways. Cultural appropriation is an example. Is it a bad thing? Well, it sort of depends. If you look at Japanese woodblock prints from the 19th century, they're hugely popular in Japan, and yet they're a very informal commodity. They were made in mass numbers. They weren't necessarily valued or preserved in a particular way not because there wasn't an appreciation of them, but because that's where they were in the economic system, that they were mass produced and, and you replaced them. They were constantly being produced. They became prized collector items in the United States, in Western Europe, and influenced whole generations of artists. So the, the, the Japanisma, the, the idea of taking the Japanese design aesthetic really takes off not only in visual arts, but in writing, Oscar Wilde writes about it at the end of the 19th century. There was a fascination with it, and it had a, a very pervasive and permanent influence on Western art. Well, is that cultural appropriation? And if it is, is it good or bad? Mm -hmm. We generally think of cultural appropriation as a bad thing, but those are topics we can keep revisiting. We're in the midst of, of the Me Too movement right now, and an obvious example there is, you may have an artist who made a stunning work of art, and yet, they were very flawed human beings. We have that discussion, say, about the films of Woody Allen. Mm. Whatever you think, mm -hmm. should allegations about a given film director influence how we view their work? Mm. Or should their work stand alone? Mm. And I don't know the answer to either the question mm. or for any given f filmmaker or artist if the allegations are even true. But it's a, an important question. Do you in allow your understanding of who the artist was to influence the way the work is understood? Mm -hmm. That's a huge question because a lot of the souls of the artists are torn in some way which makes the art very beautiful and, and so when but then when you dig at what this how the soul was torn it can it can set sometimes be a big turnoff for people to enjoy the work that's a that's a really important point. So there are lots of topics we can keep talking about and, and revisiting. And that was a real learning experience for me. I kind of had the sense that if you've, you've addressed a question, it's hard to come back and address it again in another exhibition without audiences thinking, well, we've already seen that. And yeah. it turns out that a lot of times you can address the same question in very different ways, and the audience will respond in different ways. Our understanding of it has changed, their understanding of it has changed, and that's an interesting conversation in its own right. Yeah. Um, last last question. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts about the current state of humanity and where you think, how you feel about things and how you feel things are going. I alternate between being very depressed and very elated. There are outrages every day that fill the headlines. They fill our hearts. We try to deal with them but they just seem to come faster and faster. That can be very daunting because it feels like all the bad things in the world are happening faster and faster and we can't keep up with them. There's hardly time to mourn for the things we've lost before we learn of another thing that yeah. we're losing. At the same time, we're at the American Anthropological Association meetings and it's very heartening to see all the ways anthropology is trying to deal with those issues. Right now, the Paradise Fire has already claimed more lives than any other fire in California history, and there are more than a thousand people still missing. All of those fire crews have anthropologists embedded with them trying to help with the recovery of human remains. 
when Ebola was hitting parts of Africa. The attempt to slow down the spread of Ebola really didn't succeed until we brought anthropologists on board because the problem wasn't a medical problem. It was a cultural problem of certain practices that, that fostered the spread of Ebola. Mm. And once we understood those, mm -hmm. we could address them. Most of the problems we face, for better or worse, are cultural problems. Global warming is another example. We think about it as an environmental or ecological issue, but ultimately it's a cultural issue. Mm. If it was purely due to natural effects, we wouldn't need to worry about that. But it's anthropogenic climate change. And if we don't understand it culturally, we can't figure out how to address it. So I'm heartened by the fact we have so many really smart colleagues here trying to address that huge range of issues across all of humanity. I don't know if we can do it fast enough, and I'm not sure everybody's always listening, but if we're open to evidence-based results, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think anthropology has a lot to contribute to the answer. That's so well said that we're... News is moving so fast that it makes it so difficult to keep up with even the current, what's going on currently. But you, I think you have the right, you have the right way of of teaching us about about evidence based progress in in society, and and I think that you're right. This is a really beautiful place to to explore the minds of so many people that are trying to follow a evidence-based practice for the progress of society. Um, Alex, this has been such a pleasure. This has been super nice. Thank you for coming on to the I've show. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Check out Alex's work also in links in the bio, AAA's links in the bio as well. Check them out. Go and build your dreams into the world. Go manifest the future that you want to live in. Much love, everyone. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you soon. Peace.